Hi, my name is Patrick Egan with Educational Renaissance. This week, I'm starting a new series on human development, or we might call it child development, where we look to the deep past in the classical era and bring that forward to modern day to consider ways in which we can best understand developments in child development. As we do so, this is going to help us raise categories that will give us insight into the nature of children, ways in which they are developing as human beings. And as we do so, that is going to help us as teachers to hone our craft of teaching, to create the best learning environments, because we will understand the nature of the children that we have in our care. Well, we begin by considering the concepts of the mind. How does the mind learn? How does the mind access information? Well, when we go back to the ancient world, we look at two great figures, Plato and Aristotle. When we begin with Plato, we are confronted with the concept of the innate mind. Now, innate knowledge is stuff that is already stored there in the mind. And Plato, as he considers both the nature of the mind and the goals of education, these things work together for him to help him understand the goals of education. As we think through what Plato is on about, we understand how his goals for education were to help create a ruling class that maintained the order and structure of society so that everybody in that society could be free. Now, there was a compulsory level of education that all boys and girls would be a part of, uh, at least in theory. I, I don't know to what extent this was true in practice, that all boys and girls were a part of this. Now, keep in mind, as he is thinking about education in Republic and laws, he's considering ways in which the whole society ought to work. It's philosophical and theoretical in nature. And as he lays out this scheme, it's hard to know whether he's actually describing the nature of things or describing the ways in which he would like education to be. And so we'll consider it actually in light of the latter situation. He's thinking of the ideal situation to train and raise people for a free and virtuous society. Now, I just mentioned that word, virtuous. Another of his goals is to create the best possible society by enhancing or cultivating the virtue or arete of the people. So the goal of education for the youngest children is to give them opportunities to sing and to dance. In Plato's thinking, he knows that they don't have control over their voices or their bodies. And so choir and dance are prescribed as the educational means to produce good singing, good movement. And his advice is to present to students those songs, those rhythms, to help children be their best selves. These are good examples of rhythm, good examples of music, so that they are unlocking the virtue within. Keep in mind, Plato is thinking about innate knowledge and that this virtue is inside of them, but it's untapped, it's unused. And in order to bring all of that virtue out, students need to be presented with the best things, the most virtuous things, so that those virtues are brought out. Now, he promotes this idea of mimesis, or what we might call imitation. The goal is for students to imitate the movements that are beautiful, that are good, that are worthy, to sing songs that are good and worthy, to help them imitate that which is good so that they become the embodiment of that which is virtuous. Now in later years, the late teens, he prescribes that all male children then enter into military training and they go through drills 
and there's further honing of the physical body to conform to the standards of military practice. Then in the 20s, that's when Plato prescribes that students go on to advanced levels of study, whether it's philosophy, metaphysics, mathematics. And so <laughs> when we think about our own educational model, that's very late in a child's career to be beginning those studies. But in Plato's thinking, the most important thing to establish broadly in society is virtue. And then you build upon that this guardian level, those people that will guard the free society, and then those who will be the ruling class of society, who will be in charge of establishing law and order, they will go on to those advanced studies that are required of the people that will be part of the ruling class. Having looked at Plato, we can now turn to Aristotle and his educational ideals in many ways are similar to Plato. He still has a lofty goal of education for all of society. Now, where Plato would have considered the goal of education to be creating a, an ordered and free society, Aristotle does not disagree with that, but he adds in this element of the happiness of society that society, the individuals of that society, would experience eudaimonia, or happiness. It's this sense of well-being and purpose in life where their course is set and they are happy in their role in life. Now, what Aristotle would say, and this is another point of agreement between Plato and Aristotle, is that the way we get that is by virtue, or arete. So there's that virtue thing again, that when people are trained in virtue, it elicits happiness and the entire society can be happy together in their free and ordered society. The educational program is largely the same with a compulsory education for all children that has to do with their physical movement. Now, Plato includes choir and dance as part of his educational program. Aristotle includes those along with gymnastics and speech. He wants students to learn from the great examples of rhetoricians that have gone before. And by doing so, the mind is being given examples of great speeches. And as they memorize those and present those those speeches with their active mouths are becoming ways in which they are habituated to that which is virtuous. Now, I just use the word habituated, and that's one of the distinctives of Aristotle. His educational program highlights habits, and habits are really important to Aristotle because of his theory of the mind. Plato believed the mind to have innate knowledge. And the goal of education was to unlock those things that are already embedded in the mind. What Aristotle believes is that the mind is a blank slate, a tabula rasa. And it's the goal of education to write on that mind. And the way this happens is by enabling the learner to discover new things. That act of discovery is what he considers learning to be. And so one is habituated into virtue by discovering that thing, whether it be courage or honor, and then to practice those things habitually, having discovered what the thing is. Because those virtues aren't innate in the individual, they must be discovered and learned. Well, how does one learn those things? Well, by looking to the great examples. Where do we see courage occurring? Well, we discover those in the great stories, in the great narratives, in the great artwork and statuary. And so as students learn these things, as they discover that which is true, good, and beautiful, they are then encouraged to become habituated, to practice the habits that will evoke virtue in their lives. So to sum up Plato and Aristotle, we have two great figures from the ancient past 
who are talking about many of the same goals of education, and yet their understanding of the mind is radically different. One believes that knowledge is innate in the mind, the other believes that that mind is a blank slate, and it's the goal of education to write the good and worthy things on that mind. Now we're going to jump ahead in time from this classical world to the Enlightenment. And during the Enlightenment, there was a debate that raged between two camps. One were the rationalists, the other the empiricist. And much of what I have to say now drastically reduces the entire debate to a few bullet points and does not give them their due. There's many great things that these philosophers brought forward that are of value and worthy of consideration. But there is an element of their theory of mind that actually just keeps building on Plato and Aristotle. We can go back to the early rationalists like Descartes and Leibniz, and what they're articulating is that this innate knowledge helps us to understand that there are things in our mind, like logic, that help us to think, that are the the understructure or the girding of the way in which we think, and that there are certain universals that can be observed in the world that point to the fact that because they're universal, they must be innate in all of us. And so the rationalists had come up with a coherent picture of the way we understand knowledge, at least rather important ideas like our knowledge of God or morality in certain terms, to be innate. Now, the empiricists completely denied this. They were blank slate theorists, and they believed that the mind was largely material. So when we look at Hobbes, that was his view. Our brains are just a bundle of nerves, and that the notion of mind is that our thoughts are just added into this material brain structure. To that end, somebody like Locke would say, we learn through our sense experience. And because our senses are interacting with the world around us, we're just acquiring new information and our nerves, our material is just storing that information as it comes into contact with it. There's nothing innate there. It's all just new experiences coming at us through senses. By the time we get to Hume, there's a great amount of skepticism about things like virtue, religion, faith, belief, revelation, miracle, because it's all reduced down into sense experience, and only those things can be experienced in the material world. Our experience of things outside that material world are outside our empirical knowledge and therefore really aren't fair game, so say the empiricists. So that leads us to one end, in the empirical end, where blank slate theory basically dictates what we can know and what we can't know. Gone from the blank slate understanding is the notion that because there's a blank slate, what needs to be presented to the mind are things that are noble, good, true, beautiful, to cultivate in that person that which is virtuous. Now, that might mean, if you see that dead end, let's go to the rationalists. Maybe they're on to something. Well, the innate theorists wind up coming to a very different end, but it's equally problematic. And it, it does so, or it comes to this end through Rousseau, who says, yes, there's innate knowledge there. It's, it's this pristine, very good, pure, childlike thing. And what happens is that culture is the thing that is the negative influence that ruins the pure, almost perfect childlike experience. Other scholars will call what Rousseau described as the noble savage, which is uh, maybe a bit of a misnomer, not really something that Rousseau himself said, but it's this idea that the child in that pure and pristine innate sense is noble. And what ruins the child is actually culture. That when we tr attempt to 
connect children to say something like the Western heritage, the values of culture, that that's actually what ruins the child. So when you go to the innate theorists in the Enlightenment, they lead us to another dead end, gone for the innatists, is virtue. And so we can follow both of these strands, initiating from two different people who both saw as the end and product of education to be virtue in Plato and Aristotle. And when those are taken up by the Enlightenment thinkers, it leads us to a very different end, where virtue is now gone. Sense experience on the one hand, because we're just material minds experiencing the material world around us through our senses, or this notion that whatever is good in humanity, in infantile form, gets ruined by these things of culture that we grown-ups think are good, but actually ruin the children. In my recent post on educational renaissance, I mention a recent scholar, uh, Steven Pinker, who writes about blank slate. And the way he addresses this is by looking at neurobiology as well as cognitive science. And what he notices is that the brain structure bundles all kinds of things in an innate way, that there are structures that seem to be present in our brains that initiate or determine certain outcomes for us educationally. We could call these genes. They are genes, and they predispose us in certain directions. While that's true, part of what he says is even though we have this innate stuff that we could call genetic material, it's only part of the equation. Our environments still have an impact on the direction we go, that certain genes don't really uh, operate or they aren't fulfilled unless there are environmental factors that bring those out or cause them to kind of turn on, if you will. So when we think about our classrooms, we can think about how each child has these different predispositions, personalities, traits, dispositions towards things that in many ways are pre-programmed, they're innate in them. And yet he also looks at neuroplasticity, our brain material, even with this innate genetic code, is malleable. We can change that our genes aren't so determinative that it means that we aren't a math person or we aren't a music person. As a matter of fact, much effort can be applied so that we can gain skill and aptitude in quite a number of areas. This is where Aristotle's habits come in. As we imitate these great and virtuous things, we can actually acquire habits that are greater than we might be predisposed to be. There's great effort that can go into acquiring skill, even if we don't have an innate talent in it. He also looks at cognitive science. And one of the things he notes that in many respects goes back to Leibniz is this notion that there are these universals, ways in which multiple cultures seem to share a moral code. He looks at somebody like a Noam Chomsky and his theory of language, that there are deep structures in language that are following these grammatical rules that are the same in multiple different languages, even though they have different scripts and are separated worlds apart. There's this deep underlying structure which points to some kind of innate understanding we all share about language, but also about morality, things that we, we know are true and good, despite the fact that we might apply those rules of morality in different ways. One of the goals of blank slate theory was to say, if we clear the decks of all religious belief, won't that solve all of our world's problems? Won't that make us so that we can look past things like religious differences, racial and ethnic background? If everybody's a blank slate, all we have to do is teach them differently, write a new moral code on them, 
and then we'll all get along. And he, and Pinker says, that just isn't true. That just doesn't happen. Um, that actually religion, faith, belief matters to some extent. His point is sound that there's this universal that shows us there's some kind of innate stuff within us, and yet we can learn new things. Each of us has this potential to go in different directions. One way that this strikes me is thinking about one of the concepts that Jordan Peterson talks about, how our brains are wired to respond to snakes in various ways. When we encounter a snake in the wild, we don't have to think, oh, is that a snake? And then respond to it. If, if we had to do all of that cognitive work, we'd get bitten by a poisonous snake. Instead, what happens is our eyeballs already see that it's a snake and our nerves are reacting to it because of innate things that are bundled together so that we have lightning quick reflexes to snakes that are deeply embedded in our minds. What Jordan Peterson does is he pivots from there to consider how all kinds of different cultures have narratives surrounding dragons that we embed in story these notions of this deeply embedded neural structure. We create stories to think about this fear response to snakes. Why is it that we need a heroic person to confront the dragon? And we can see ways in which this whole dragon narrative, the neurology of our brains to respond to snakes, is all connected to things like the Garden of Eden and the story of man's first fall. There are three quick takeaways that I think are worthy of us considering, practical in nature. As we think about our classrooms and working with students, understanding that their minds have these qualities, and, and where I've brought us is to a place where we see there's some amount of innate knowledge in our minds, but also this blankness to a child's mind. There's more that they can learn. There's both innate qualities and malleable qualities that this neuroplasticity works with a certain amount of innate genetic biological structure. That all makes sense. However, what we need to do is re-engage that notion of what the mind is and is capable of with the older notion that both Aristotle and Plato were committed to, that the goal of education is arete, it's virtue, that our education is not just about mere knowledge. It's not just about the technical nature of facts and information or a technique in learning those. It's actually about something that's very value rich. And as we have this educational renewal movement, we can look around at the landscape of school options and see ways in which when education is divorced from values, from virtues, that it becomes a, a shell or a husk of all that it could be in forming individuals who can really lead society to experience the eudaimonia, the happiness that Aristotle talks about or the freedom and order that Plato talks about. So a value-rich education is one of our practical takeaways. Let us not shy away from those conversations that would help students connect their learning to that which is oriented to values. The other thing is that our minds seem to be predisposed to think in certain ways. And one way in which we think is according to story. It's very prominent in early education that children are highly responsive to story. Think about uh, your young children, whether it's your own young ones or nieces and nephews. The best way to connect with a young child is to read a storybook. It's because they are highly responsive to story, to narrative, 
and you can pack all kinds of information and new ideas into great stories. As a matter of fact, one of the enduring values of the great works is the ways in which they embed within themselves great ideas in story format. There's this great Charlotte Mason quote where she writes, I have so far urged that knowledge is necessary to men and that in the initial stages, it must be conveyed through a literary medium, whether it be knowledge of physics or of letters, because there would seem to be some inherent quality in mind which prepares it to respond to this form of appeal and no other. This quote really points to Charlotte Mason's own view that there's some innate quality to the mind that makes it predisposed to be highly responsive to story. Throw lots of stories at them, throw lots of value rich stories at them and your children will be well educated. The last idea is that our children are not just bundles of innate knowledge. There's a lot of potential. There's ways in which there are blank slate portions of the brain ready to be written on. And there's this idea of neuroplasticity, which means even a child who isn't predisposed to mathematics or a child who isn't predisposed to a sport or to music can, through careful training, become skilled in those areas, maybe even to enjoy them. So let us not shy away from exposing our students to a wide array of subjects to help them not just take this static view of themselves, well, I'm a math student, well, I'm not a math student, but to help them see themselves as pot potential learners in all fields that uh, they can become growth oriented learners to see ways in which they can acquire new knowledge. Well, I hope this has been a helpful review of a lot of heavy hitting philosophy, but it's also with a view to helping us in practical ways to provide great learning environments for our students. Here at Educational Renaissance, we are promoting a rebirth of ancient wisdom for the modern era. And you can join us in this Renaissance by reading our blog posts, watching these videos, listening to our podcast. You can find all of these things at educationalrenaissance.com. Well, thanks for listening.